Hello everyone, I'm Stefan Hagstadt and today I'm going to talk about bounds and light star neutrinos from Cosmology and Laboratory. Um, I give the archive number here if you want to read up uh, on about it or you can listen in the next 20 minutes or so. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, why neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are always good for surprises. So we now know that neutrinos have a small mass and uh, this mass is not explained in the standard model of particle physics. So you need some new ingredient to actually provide this mass term for neutrinos. Um, additionally, the fact that they have mass also leads to oscillations. I will talk about that in a minute. And generally, neutrinos are only weakly interacting and that makes uh, measuring their properties very, very challenging. So there's always the possibility that there's unknown physics hiding there. So let's briefly talk about neutrino oscillations. Um, so if you produce a neutrino um, of a given flavor, so electron, muon, or tau, and you just let the neutrinos propagate, then this propagation will take place in the mass eigenbasis and not in the flavor basis. Uh, the consequence of that is that if you place a detector a little bit away, then you're measuring a different flavor composition of this neutrino. So the fact that the flavor basis and the mass basis are not the same leads to neutrino oscillations. And to translate from one to the other, uh, you need the so-called neutrino mixing matrix that I will always denote with this U in this talk. All right, and if we look at it uh, in a bit more detail, then um, the overall oscillation probabilities are governed by the neutrino mixing matrix that I always uh, already introduced, the mass splitting between the states, and um, an L over E factor, um, so the length travel divided by the neutrino energy, which basically just measures the effective distance traveled by the neutrino. And I made this little sketch to show you what happens if you start with an electron neutrino and you just let it propagate, and uh, slowly you are developing these muon and tau uh, flavors. So just note that the axis here is given in Earth radii over GV, so you have to let the neutrino propagate for quite a while to actually watch it turn into a different flavor. All right, um, so are there more than just these three neutrinos? Well, just from a point of view of oscillations, the question is um, pretty straightforward. So you can always just make the um, mixing matrix a little bit bigger, and that's how you would account for an additional state. But you have to keep in mind that we actually have measurements of the Z decay, and that limits the um, number of weakly interacting light neutrinos, so uh, neutrinos that have at most half of the Z mass. So one consequence of this constraint is that um, any additional light neutrino, if it exists, must be sterile in the sense that it doesn't take part in the weak interaction. And those are exactly the particles that we will look at in this talk. All right, so um, we can still look for these particles, even if they're not weakly interacting, at so-called short baseline searches. Um, so short here means that L over E's are of order electron volt squared. And um, the appealing uh, thing to construct such an experiment is that, um, as, I, as I've shown before, um, the other oscillations only take place on the, um, basically you have to wait for the neutrino to travel thousands of kilometers or at least hundreds. Um, these short baselines basically lead to the fact that you can ignore all the other um, known oscillations. So you're only sensitive to the effect of any additional fourth um, neutrino species. So that's the big advantage to um, why you would look at the short baselines. And then there are two different ways how you can build your experiment. So either you can look for the appearance of a given flavor. So you start with um, your given flavor, you have a source of neutrinos, and you detect a different flavor that is basically created out of the original neutrino. So you, you're looking for a flavor change. And again, like if you're looking at short baselines, then the other oscillations can't do this. So if you um, detect such a flavor change, then that's basically, um, if you can exclude the possibility that the neutrino came from somewhere else, that's immediate um, evidence for an additional um, oscillation um, with an additional fourth neutrino.
So um, effectively, you're measuring the uh, mixing angles, so the, uh, the mixing matrix of your two flavors that you're um, starting with and that you're observing with this additional fourth neutrino that might be there. Uh, the big advantage here is that your background is very, very small because the flavor that you're looking for is originally not even there. But also your signal is very small, so it's a very challenging experiment. The other way to look for these neutrinos is um, in the disappearance channel. So you can also start with a, a neutrino flux. And if you know the flux and you just um, remeasure the flux at a certain distance, then you can basically measure if any of the um, neutrinos that were originally there change flavor in between. So the principle is, is very similar, but uh, the measurement works a bit differently because you, you're here uh, looking at uh, only um, one flavor of neutrinos. And uh, with these kind of measurements, you're sensitive of, um, to the mixing matrix between the neutrino flavor that you're measuring and an additional fourth neutrino. All right, and uh, these measurements actually have been done. So uh, by the LSND and later by the mini boon collaborations. Um, and both experiments detected the appearance of electron antineutrinos out of a um, pion beam, so muon antineutrinos. And both experiments found an excess of events. So first LSND and later mini boon was built to check this result and found the same. Um, so these both experiments measured more neutrinos than they expected, um, so more than just the background level. And uh, this could be explained by an additional sterile neutrino around the uh, uh, electron volt mass scale. And um, as you can see here uh, in the plot on the right, the preference for this is around three sigma. So, um, Similar, result or similar results come from nuclear reactors, uh, where people are measuring the disappearance of uh, electron neutrinos. And um, this is one of these experiments where you have a source of a known neutrino flux, and you measure how this flux decays over distance. Um, and what several measurements find is that you get the modulation of the flux with varying L over E. So this is exactly the signal that you would expect from an uh, additional oscillation contribution. And the combined uh, significance of uh, various of these reactor measurements is again around three sigma uh, for a sterile neutrino um, that's very close to this mini boon parameter space, so also around uh, the EV mass scale. All right, so if you take both of these measurements together, then you would also expect um, essentially a coupling of muon neutrinos with this additional sterile neutrino. And uh, you would also expect to see it then in the muon uh, neutrino disappearance channel. And this is actually something that, for example, the MINOS collaboration or IceCube can look at, and they don't see this effect. So this is very, very confusing. And um, there are several papers that try to get a global fit. Um, so they try to fit the neutrino properties to all of these measurements. And the short answer is that it's not really possible. So you can't explain all the data we have with an easy or with a simple additional sterile neutrino. Something just doesn't fit. So in a situation like this, we can ask ourselves, can we check this in another way? So can we cross check these results? And one way to do this is to look at uh, tritium uh, decay or beta decay experiments in general where you measure the endpoint of the decay spectrum and the effective endpoint mass gets contributions from all neutrino uh, states. So if there's an additional fourth neutrino, then this endpoint mass is modified. And uh, currently the Katrin collaboration um, constrains this effective and beta mass to be less than 1.1 EV or so. The other way to look for um, these results, or for these steroids, in another way is uh, to look at double beta decay. So if neutrinos are Majorana particles, so if they are their own antiparticles, then you can observe uh, this reaction where two neutrons decay into two protons and two electrons without any neutrinos being emitted. And uh, this process has a half-life that again depends on an effective neutrino mass scale, this n beta beta mass, which is now given by a coherent sum over all of the neutrino mass states. So again, you get contributions from a fourth neutrino if it's there. 
So can those, uh, you're right, and the, the current uh, limits um, of the half-life are something like 10 to the 26 years. So this is a very, very rare process. And that translates into an effective limit on M beta beta of something like 0.3 electron volts. So now, of course, we want to know if these results can uh, actually constrain the signal region that we looked at before. So where reactors, for example, uh, see something weird going on. Um, so the bad news is that neutrinoless double beta decay is not able to actually check these uh, results. And also cutting currently from beta decay um, only very weakly disfavors the reactor results, but is not really able to tell if there's something going on there or not. So then we have to look for other ways. And one very appealing way is to look at cosmology. All right, so how would we actually do this in cosmology? Um, the big challenge here is to essentially translate the sterile neutrino parameters, so the mass splitting between the um, new state and the other states and the mixing matrix into cosmological observables. So for example, CMB power spectra or um, the meta power spectrum that we can see at late times. And um, to do this, you have to solve um, basically for the production of the sterile neutrino in the early universe. And to do that, you have to solve this Liouville equation that I sketched here. And it looks a bit scary, um, essentially because it is. Okay, so this is very, very difficult to do because you have to account for the expanding background. You have to account for vacuum oscillation terms. You have interactions with electron background, with the neutrino background, and then you have in addition scatterings, weak interactions in the early universe. And all of those terms are important at different times, so you can't neglect them. Um, this is numerically very, very, very challenging, and that's why people usually just treated this um, within a one plus one framework. That means that they had one active neutrino coupled to one sterile neutrino. And um, so here we go for the first time to the full three plus one case where we take all the three known neutrinos into account and couple them completely um, in a completely general way to this additional sterile neutrino. And this is only possible thanks to this new Fortepiano code uh, developed by my collaborators. And what Fortepiano does essentially is it computes the um, distribution function of the sterile neutrino in the early universe. So shown here in this plot on the left is one example for time evolution of this distribution function, just expressed um, divided by um, a normal family Dirac distribution function of the other active neutrinos. And you can see that over time, so early times and hot temperatures are shown in red here, and later times and cooler temperatures are shown in blue, you can see how the sterile neutrino is slowly populated um, from the active flavors that are just thermi thermically um, produced, thermally produced, um, and then you populate the sterile via uh, an oscillation resonance. And um, the result is that you get a, a distribution function for the sterile that still looks very much like a family Dirac distribution, um, but it has this additional proportion proportionality factor here, so it reaches an um, maximum amplitude, just expressed here by delta n effective. And that really is just the additional contribution of the sterile to the relativistic degrees of freedom in the early universe. So um, because the shape of the distribution function is so similar to the active neutrinos, that's very good news for cosmology because we can just treat it uh, as an additional neutrino um, characterized by uh, its contribution to the um, effective number of degrees of freedom by an effective and, for example, by the late time abundance omega s. Okay, so this is the late time density of the sterile neutrino. All right, um, so how does this look like if we scan the sterile neutrino parameter space? So here's one example where I'm fixing all of the um, uh, mixing matrix elements to be equal. Um, and I'm just scanning the parameter space and I look how an effective changes. So how much essentially the sterile contributes to the um, light degrees of freedom in the early universe. And you can see that um, uh, for large couplings, the sterile is fully thermalized and you basically have a contribution of one additional um, neutrino uh, species 
Um, and the um, according cosmic density is shown here. So here I'm, I'm plotting the sterile density as a, um, or normalized to the dark matter density. Um, and you can see that the contribution of the sterile to the dark matter is in this parameter space we're looking at very, very small. Okay, so in this parameter space, the sterile cannot be the dark matter candidate. It can only um, be a very, very small contribution. Um, all right. Okay, so how are we doing this then? We have the sterile neutrino parameters. So we um, have a given set of mass splittings and mixing matrix elements. We use Fortepiano to calculate the um, distribution functions. And with those, in principle, we could directly calculate the uh, um, observables. In practice, um, we actually take a shortcut where we just ca calculate an effective and the late time abundance, omega s, from the distribution functions. We tabulate those and we use a smart machine learning interpolation to provide those parameters for the given sterile neutrino parameters. And then we plug those numbers into class, calculate our cosmological um, observables, and then we plug it into our cosmological likelihoods, in this case, um, CMB and BEO data. And the idea is that the CMB and the um, BAO data have a certain range of an effective and effective neutrino masses that they allow for. And the answer is now basically how can you fill out this um, um, neutrino mass and effective plot with sterile neutrino parameters. So which sterile neutrino parameters are allowed by this constraint on an effective and neutrino masses. All right, and the results are shown here. Um, the answer is essentially that as soon as any of the mixing matrix elements is larger than 10 to the minus three or so, then um, you start populating the sterile and you start seeing it. So it starts contributing to um, an effective of order one. And this is exactly where the constraints kick in. So an effective of four is not allowed by the data. Uh, there is a small degeneracy with the mass splitting, and we can understand this just by remembering this um, plot that I showed before. You can essentially walk along this diagonal, so you can always um, find um, different sets of um, uh, mass splittings and mixing matrix elements that give you similar ineffectives. But this degeneracy is not perfect, and as soon as the um, mixing is large enough, you populate it and then you would see it. All right, so if we go back to our results, um, where I showed the previous constraints, then cosmology completely rules out this uh, region preferred by the reactor anomalies. Um, and it's way, the constraint is way, way stronger than what we've gotten previously from um, the other experiments. All right, we can also look at Miniboon, and our reanalysis of the Miniboon data is still ongoing, but luckily, um, I did my, my own little analysis with pen and paper, and it's not even close. So cosmology rules out mini boon ex, um, again by orders of magnitude. Any signal that could explain, or any sterile neutrino that could explain the mini boon signal would lead to a th um, thermalized um, neutrino, and that would have shown up in cosmology by now. All right, there's also new data out uh, just last week from Daya Bay and Minos. Um, and they also find, so these are um, uh, oscillation experiments, and they also find that uh, large parts of the mini boon regions are excluded by the new data. So something in mini boon seems not to, um, seems still to be very um, weird. So, but again, note that the cosmological limits here are way stronger than even these, these new results. All right, now we can also translate the cosmological limits to uh, the parameters probed by um, beta decay or neutrinoless double beta decay. So they are slightly model dependent, but they're way stronger than the current limits. Um, and um, so while they are model dependent, let me stress that the model dependence is not very strong. Um, so to accommodate something like an effective of four, you have to modify your cosmological model very, very strongly. All right. Uh, we also looked at different prior effects. So um, I mentioned that there is this degeneracy between the mass splitting and the mixing matrix elements. You can choose reasonable different priors on the mass splitting, for example, depending on your um, preferences. Um, but they don't change 
the big picture results. So you um, get slightly lower or higher allowed limits on the mixing matrix elements. But um, the point is that once you start exceeding those, uh, you populate a sterile no matter what. So with the prior, you can essentially um, slightly shift along this degeneracy, but um, there's no way that you can actually um, get to the mini boon or LSND or reactor anomaly regions. All right. So as I mentioned before, um, this was the first time we actually looked at uh, three active neutrinos coupled to a sterile instead of just using the simplified one plus one framework. So um, one question we were asking is, what is actually the difference to these previous studies? And um, at first glance, there's quite a large difference. So the results look very similar. But it turns out that most of the difference is just the parameter space volume effect. So if you have three active neutrinos coupled to the sterile, in your parameter space, there's just more ways to populate the sterile because you can go over any of the active neutrinos, not just one. And in the paper, we explain how to account for this effect. And once you do this, you actually don't really have to go through all of the um, very difficult calculations and include all three active neutrinos. You can just account for the parameter volume effect and be mostly done with it. All right. So let me conclude. Um, the situation in short baseline oscillation experiments is still very much unclear. So something is going on there that we don't understand. What we do know now is that um, it can't be at least a, a simple sterile neutrino because that would be seen by cosmology. So cosmology completely rules out any uh, simple sterile neutrino explanation. If you want to accommodate a sterile, you have to include more new physics to actually accommodate essentially something like any factor of four, and that's very challenging. So um, the other point I want to make is that uh, also in general, cosmology provides the strongest currently available limits um, on these beta decay parameters, and um, that's something, something new that we found. And you can yeah, read the paper, and I'm looking forward to the discussions. See you soon.